The audience will remain muted during the entire online session. We encourage you to provide your questions at any time in writing via the Q&A field at the right corner and please submit. The recorded webinar session will be made available afterwards. So good afternoon. A warm welcome to today's Ecolab customer online seminar about air hygiene in food and beverage operations. I am Marion Lindner Mertens, Marketing Manager for the segment Food at Ecolab Food and Beverage Division in Europe. I am your host during this online seminar. My co host is Sandra Saul, Marketing Director for the segment Protein and Food at Ecolab Food and Beverage Division in Europe, and we hope you enjoy the session. Our aim is to help you with all challenges around air hygiene in your food and beverage operations. Before we start, please let me introduce our panelists first. So today we've got at the panel Stephanie Kitt, Application Specialist, Food and Beverage in UK and Ireland, Peter Birchno, our Microbiologist for Food and Beverage in Europe, Thomas Tiborski, Manager, Technical Support, Food and Beverage for Germany and Switzerland, and Michael Stavart, Application Manager and Specialist for Whole Europe based in Denmark. These panelists will present different chapters to you and will be available at the end of the session to answer as many of your questions as possible. For questions which cannot be answered online today, we'll prepare and provide FAQ respectively. So let's start. Steph, the stage is yours. Thank you, Marian. When I started to think about the content for this seminar, I thought about food and beverage factories that I've visited and supported over the last 20 years and various questions that have come up in that time and problems that we've helped to solve. And also in discussion with some of my colleagues on the team, I know that these aren't unique to just one factory. Questions like these that we can see on the screen now, Think about if these might be relevant to your factory or your facility. Things like this. We have an issue with environmental mold growth. Can you help? Can you help improve the air quality in our chills? What could Ecolab supply to spray into an airlock between rooms to help control microbial growth on packs? Could you help us reduce off complaints in final product? Do you have any chemical we could apply via our existing air handling system to improve our air quality? How could I improve my shelf life? Can we reduce yeast and mold levels on our packed cheese? Could we reduce high TVC counts on our cooked sliced meat? Do people have any technology to help control COVID-19? We believe that over the course of this seminar, we can help answer some, if not all of them, plus any that arise during the session. So how can these questions be answered? I'm confident that the areas of concern similar to these on the screen, where you feel that you need support from your hygiene partner, can be solved using one-off or a combination of the following applications shown on this slide. So air treatment, there are various options for this available. And this can be the treatment of air in a whole facility via an air handling system, or working directly in critical areas, and potentially could be used during production periods. And more detail on, on these options will be discussed later on in the session. Surface disinfection. So there are four main standard methods for applying disinfectants to surfaces. We can spray disinfectant on. We can foam it onto surfaces. We can wipe the surface with disinfectant. And we can also disinfect surfaces using fogging as an application method through aerosolization. And now I'm going to hand over to Peter because he is going to talk you through the differences 
between surface disinfectants and air treatment. Thanks, Steph. So, um, when, reg when registering an antimicrobial product, it needs to have passed certain test protocols depending upon the application. This is a tiered approach to testing comprising of a suspension test, phase two, step one, and a surface test, phase two, step two. In addition to these mandatory tiers, a simulated use test, also known as a phase three test, can be carried out if deemed applicable. A simulated use test involves recreating the scenarios in which one anticipates that a product would be used. Today we are talking about applications where products are applied as aerosols, of which there are two. These being very distinct from each other with completely different outcomes. So first, surface disinfection through aerosolization, often referred to as fogging, is a phase two, step two method where the product is fogged into a closed room in the absence of personnel, where it settles onto the surfaces and disinfects during the application contact time. There is also time factored into the application to ensure that the biocide levels in the room are at a safe level to allow for re-entry. During this application, no air treatment can be claimed as defined by the standard. The second application is air treatment where the product is again applied as an aerosol and comes into contact with the airborne microorganisms having a killing or inactivation effect. Products are formulated in a manner which slows down the sedimentation rate, keeping it airborne for longer. And when dosed in such a manner, the aerosol itself does not reach the surfaces. And as a result, there is no effect on any microbial contamination, if present, on any surfaces within the room. Additionally, providing human health risk assessments are favorable, personnel can be present during the application, thereby providing air treatment during production rather than as a post-shift application. So for the fogging application, a European norm has recently been published based on NFT 72281, which is a local French standard which will now be phased out and be replaced by EN 17272. This standard has built on the local French methodology by including distribution tests and acknowledging the implications of surface to volume ratio, thereby providing a robust test methodology for which to work with. There are essentially two parts to this EN test method. Firstly, a fixie test is carried out to determine if the airborne treatment process is capable of killing the target organisms on surfaces under predefined conditions. The second is a distribution test, which uses inoculated test carriers strategically placed throughout the test chamber to determine that the distribution of the product, when in combination with the device, achieves the claimed activity throughout the entire room. Once the fixie test and distribution tests have passed, the product is deemed efficacious for a fogging application. But as part of the installation at the customer site, the system and its delivered cycles need validation in situ using appropriate biological and or chemical indicators to determine that the application is covering the entire room. So the new EN guidance was published in May 2020, so it's very new, and is the method for demonstrating surface disinfection through fogging, including the external surfaces of equipment against a wide range of microorganisms, but excludes the air handling units. When we are talking about actual air treatment, there is no EN national guidance available on how to demonstrate efficacy of a product on the airborne bacteria and other microorganisms present. In the absence of guidance, Ecolab, in collaboration with TNO, developed a test strategy for assessing the effectiveness of a product in treating the air, which was aligned with the European competent authorities for approval prior to initiation of the testing. The strategy included carrying out phase two, step one suspension tests, 
to provide proof that the active substance is efficacious against the obligatory target microorganisms and followed by a simulated use test to assess the effect on the airborne microbes whilst also demonstrating that it provides no effect on services themselves, which is a key char characteristic of such products. I will now hand over to Thomas to continue the, the discussion. Yes, thank you, Peter. Um, and with this slide, I will make a short summary of the previous presented hygiene methods. At treatment with microbiocidal substances is a reliable way to keep bacteria counts low even during production. Our in air specs, for instance, has proven its disinfection efficacy in these areas for many years. The concentration of active substances is well adjusted, so it's safe for people in treated rooms. Air treatment reduces microorganisms only in the air but has no microbiocidal effect on surfaces or even food or beverages. On the contrary, the use of fogging technology is intended only for the disinfection of cleaned surfaces, but not for airborne microorganisms. It enables complete disinfection on surfaces, even in areas that cannot be reached or only insufficiently reached, with the, un with the usual disinfection methods. However, fogging method can only be used in the absence of personal because of high biocide concentration are applied. This method is therefore preferably used during shutdowns, for example, at weekends. A combination of daily good hygiene practices routines with air treatment and regular fogging disinfection for surfaces are suitable to increase the hygiene status and are therefore useful components in an improved safe food and beverage hygiene process. Circulating air and air handling systems carries an increased risk of microbiological transmission. If recirculation operation with low fresh air supply cannot be avoided, maybe because of technological reasons, suitable methods for air handling by separating or inactivating airborne microorganisms should be used to prevent critical concentrations of microorganisms containing aerosols in the rooms. Procedures such as filtering air, Treating it with ozone or UVC can only be used at a centralized place facility. That means that the pathogens must first be transported to these facilities. If a long time passes by between the exposure of microorganisms and their filtration or inactivation at a centralized unit, there will always be an increased risk of infection or contamination. Machines and equipment in production rooms often hinder a controlled airflow. In these cases, airborne microorganisms can remain in the room air for a long time, even if there is a centralized filter or UVC systems installed. In September this year, the Federal Institute for Work Protection and Health in Germany published a paper with which mentions that substances hazards for to health are released by ozone or UVC induced reactions. The Commission for the Establishment of Maximum Workplace Exposure Limits in Germany assessed ozone as a substance suspected of causing cancer in humans. Although numerous systems for UVC are available on the market, a specific normative description for airflow treatment is still missing. UVC in airflow treatment is still poorly investigated for viruses. With regard to the effectiveness of UVC used in air handling systems, no measurement results are currently available which indicates the inactivation of SARS-CoV-2. This has also been considered 
that UVC lamps must be monitored by measurement because their emission power decreases over time. The only current, currently available method for inactivating microorganisms directly in the room air is the decentralized use of an air treatment technology. When using air treatment, the active substances are distributed throughout the entire rooms. The microbiocidal substances act in the, immediately and directly at the source of a potential microbiocidal spread. As a result, air treatment continuously reduces microorganisms in the air and leads to a air, low airborne microbial counts. The safe application has been confirmed for many years by independent air measurements. More information on air treatment with our airspec systems will be shown later in this presentation. For the filtration of bacteria from room air, filters of class F7 to F9 are often used in food and beverage industries. With a separation rate of 40 up to 82%, these filters can reduce but not eliminate bacteria in the room air. Therefore, even when these filters are used, contamination with airborne microorganisms occur over and over again. If the task is to reduce number of viruses in the room air, the filter systems must meet highest demands. HIPAA filters provide the highest separation rates in mechanical air filtration. Within the scope of the EN 1822 standard, these filters are used as a final filter stage in sensitive processes such as pharmaceutical clean rooms, operating rooms, isolators, and other areas with the highest possible air quality requirements. However, in some existing installations, HEPA filters cannot be retrofitted because the resulting pressure drop becomes too high. To ensure an efficient separation of 99.95% of SARS-CoV-2 virus, for example, a second or third filter stage with a high efficiency filter, at least HEPA class H13, is required. If the differential pressure occurs, for instance, when a HEPA filter is used, that is significantly higher than the system design allows, a reduction of the airflow volume will then reduce the air exchange rate. This may counteract the intended removal of airborne microorganisms from the, room, from the room air. Furthermore, compliance with maintenance, inspections, cleaning, and regular filter changes must be ensured with an air handling unit. A correct supply of fresh air into rooms results in a reduction of the concentration of airborne microorganisms due to a dilution effect. In this way, the risk of infection in rooms can be lowered preventively. The reduction of airborne microorganisms through air exchange therefore represents a meaningful component of in infection protection in addition to the general rules such as social distancing, consistent application of hygiene routines, and wearing, for instance, nose and mouth masks. Special attention must be paid to the various possibilities for avoiding infection risk during air circulation. As ventilation systems suck, the outside, suck in outside air, mix it to a greater or lesser degree with the room air, and, after filtering, introduce the mixed air into the room as supply air, the following knowledge is of great importance. How much unpolluted outside air is supplied to the room? How much potentially polluted circulating air is added? To what extent is mixed air cleaned of microorganisms, for instance, by using an air treatment? And to what extent can microorganisms spread in the room and remain infectious 
in the airborne state. Area circulation tends to carry an increased risk of transmission of microorganisms. Both centralized air handling units and decentralized cooling units can distribute microorganisms containing aerosols throughout the rooms. In ad an adapted operation of air handling systems in combination with other protective measures can therefore make available preventive contribution to infection control. The methods for the reduction of airborne microorganisms can be divided into two areas, centralized and decentralized treatments. The centralized reduction includes filtering and UVC treatment. Especially in rooms where many people work, air handling can hardly protect from microbiological spreading. Appropriate supply of unpolluted fresh air and additional air treatment should then always be considered. It is recommended not to switch off the air handling systems during operation hours and preferably to keep them continuous in continuous operation. As said before, air handling systems can only reduce microorganisms when these reach suitable filter quality. Retrofitting with HEPA filters in critical operation areas is sometimes not possible. This is an important aspect and should always be taken into consideration. To protect employers from virus, the Federal Institute of Work Protection and Health in Germany recommends in its September 2020 publication for air handling systems that when these systems are operated in real circulation mode, suitable methods of air treatment by inactivating viruses should be used so that aerosols containing viruses do not remain or return in the rooms. UV light have a number of disadvantages that must be carefully managed. UVC lamps lose emission power over time and are, like filter systems, not effective close to a virus spreader. Chemical air treatment opens up the possibility to achieving a reduction directly at the source of the contamination. This is of great importance as controlled complete airflow through filters is not possible in most of the food and beverage factories. Too many air barriers, such as machines and equipment, hinder the controlled airflow. Since all methods have their strengths, but also their limitations, we consider a reasonable combination of measures to be most effective. This should always be evaluated and determined in each individual case. And with this, I hand over to Michael. Thank you, Thomas. You have now heard about different hair hygiene and air treatments. And as Thomas mentioned, Ecolab's got a solution for this called AirSpecs. So what is AirSpecs? AirSpecs is a patented antimicrobial treatment with a biocidal registration, which reduces the level of airborne bacteria, yeast, and mold before they can hit and harm food. It consists of a ready-to-use product and an application system which distributes aerosols into the air. Airspecs is classified as non-hazardous, non-humidifying, and it is toxicological harmless. The product is dispersed within production environments and processing and packaging equipment as a risk-minimizing measure to avoid spoilage of food. It is used during production hours in the presence of personnel and in close proximity to foodstuffs without any risks to human health or food products. It is continuously dispensed and it works directly in the critical areas. Air specs provide control of air hygiene during both production and non-production periods 
improving the air hygiene and the shelf life of food products. So, as mentioned, Airspace continuously protects food products against airborne microbial contamination in production, packaging, and storage environments. The application areas include air conditioning systems and ventilated areas, manufacturing premises, cooling and storage rooms, maturation rooms, and decontamination of air in packaging headspaces. On this slide, you can see an example of airspace implemented in a cold storage room. Airspace sample was taken in different locations of the cold storage room before and after the installation. And at the black line, you can see the time of installation, which was the 27th of September. And already the day after, we can see a significant reduction of airborne CFU per cubic meter. And furthermore, looking at the graph, you can see the results keeps improving the following months, proving that Airspex is capable of reducing the microorganisms in the air and avoiding the spoilage of food from airborne microorganisms. I will now hand over to Peter again to continue. Thank you, Michael. So, microorganisms come in all shapes and sizes, starting with envelope viruses being the smallest, closely followed by bacteria, with fungi being one of the largest. So, the smaller the microorganism is, the longer it is likely to remain airborne. If we look at this size chart on the left-hand side of the screen, from a simple perspective, it can be concluded that enveloped viruses will remain airborne longer, followed by bacteria, then yeast, with fungi being the largest and so settling out in theory the fastest. Obviously, this is a simplified schematic, as often bioaerosols contain different microbiology as well as organic matter, depending on what is in the air and what the source of the airborne microbiology is. In the simulated use study, the product was tested against bacteria, yeast, and fungi, and was shown to be effective at reducing the numbers of these microorganisms in the air itself. Airspex was dosed at an aerosol size of 1,000 nanometers, which falls at the center of the bacterial size range, which ranges from 200 to 2,000 nanometers. Despite the mold in yeast having larger particle sizes than the air specs aerosol, the data showed that the number of airborne yeast and mold was reduced, and this reduction was not as a result of sedimentation, but rather as a direct result of air specs treatment. When we look at the tenacity of microorganisms to antimicrobial products, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, we see that bacteria have a low tenacity to biocides than other microorganisms, for example, the molds, the bacterial spores, and the non-enveloped viruses. And as such, they are easier to kill. Sharing a similar tenacity to bacteria are the enveloped viruses, which have been shown through efficacy testing and through research to be as easy to inactivate on surfaces as bacteria are in the standard EN efficacy test. So, as mentioned previously, a simulated use test involves recreating the scenarios in which you anticipate that a product would be used. For this test to demonstrate that air specs is an effective product for air treatment, the methodology was devised in collaboration with the TNO, so the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, due to the lack of any standard test methodology being available. The target organisms tested were selected to cover efficacy against bacteria, yeast, and molds, and for the bioaerosol generation, a suspension of the target microorganism was prepared to ensure that 100 agent particles per litre was reached. This suspension was then nebulized, taking into account the chamber size, the particle size, 
flow rates and pressure. And in addition, the temperature and humidity within the chamber were also monitored. During the test, several measurements were taken assessing the decay of the bioaerosol during one hour static conditions. So the first of these measurements assessed the viability of the aerosol over time, indicating that the reduction of viable airborne microorganisms was not just down to them dying off. The second assessed the viability of the bioaerosol when exposed to water as a control to demonstrate that we are not just flushing the microorganisms out of the air. And the third measurement assessed the viability of the bioaerosol when exposed to air specs itself, demonstrating that it is the air specs which is having a direct killing effect in the air. So the viability was assessed using slit air sampling, whereby the aerosols could settle onto the surface of the agar plate, and these could then be incubated to assess whether there was any viable microbiology recovered from the settled bioaerosol. In addition to this testing, inoculated carriers were also positioned throughout the test chamber to confirm that there was no effect of air specs on surfaces, as this is a key characteristic of air specs, as previously mentioned, and that it has no surface effect at all and can be used in the presence of personnel. The specific microorganisms selected for the test were selected based on their biological safety classification uh, so, with having a BSL category of level one. So, there are a number of core messages regarding the efficacy of air specs for use in air treatment applications that we want to review in this slide. To date, the authorities have not yet defined a standard method for how to demonstrate efficacy of products for treating the air and it is not clear when such guidance will be drafted. When testing biocidal products for efficacy, a tiered approach is recommended, whereby a phase two step one suspension test and a phase two step two surface test are mandatory, followed by a phase three simulated use test or a field trial if deemed appropriate. In line with this tiered approach for product testing, Phase two step one suspension tests have been undertaken to assess the efficacy against bacteria, yeast, and fungi. As this application is designed not to have any effect on surfaces, the phase two step two surface test was not applicable, and so a simulated use test was considered a requirement due to the product being changed by diffusion through air. So we talked about here liquid versus the gas state, and was conducted against the predefined target organisms based on their safety categorization. We have also tested the efficacy against viruses, um, demonstrating efficacy through a phase two step one suspension test following the modified EN 14476 methodology, which demonstrated that air specs is efficacious against enveloped viruses when applied undiluted at both four degrees and 20 degrees C under clean conditions. So this data confirms that the active in air specs is capable of demonstrating an enveloped virucidal effect. However, it does not give us any information of how effective the product would be against viruses in the air. Where we are today, air specs is a registered product across most of Europe for air treatment directly against the airborne bacteria, yeast and mold which can be used during production, and more importantly, in the presence of personnel. I now hand you over to Marion. Thank you, Peter. So let's summarize what we heard today during our session. We explained the difference between air treatment and surface disinfection. We shared with you the methods of microbiological control. And last but not least, we guided you through the different options in air handling and introduced you to air specs and the benefits for food and beverage operations. I want to thank you, Peter, Steph, Michael, 
and Thomas for the great presentations. We are now at the end of this presentation part of our session and invite you for our Q&A session. The Q&A panel remains open for your written questions. So in addition to the panelists you know already, I'm happy to tell that Anna Febrero, Regulatory Affairs Manager for Biocide in Food and Beverage, will be also on the Q&A session. We will answer during this session as many questions as possible, now up to the full hour. A catalog of FAQ has been established and will be made available afterwards along with the recording of the webinar session. We'll add questions and answers from today's webinar as far as new to the list. I hand now over to Sandra, guiding you through the Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you. So now this is open for you. I haven't received yet a written question from the audience. So if you have anything to ask, here we go. Now it starts. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So here's a question asking, can it be used in food contact and in the headspace of a tank? I'd like to give that to Thomas, please. So I think that the question is referring to our aspects application. So in Principle that that's a way to use it. Um, if there is an airborne microbe in a tank, um, that could also be used in this environment because we have no impact on food, so neither on taste, appearance, or other impact on on disinfectant food itself, uh, which would then be not legal. Um, that is what what Peter. Uh, yeah, uh, showed you with this, this presentation, we did a TNO test where we had to demonstrate that we can reduce airborne microorganisms, but we also had to demonstrate that there is no effect on reducing microorganisms on surfaces or even on food, and we have that uh, result available. So that is a way to use air specs without uh, having, having any negative impact on the food, but to control microbes in this area. So I have to answer these questions with my answer. Okay, perfect. Let's move on. Uh, there is another one. So are there any human pathogen microorganisms or yeast against the aspects is not effective? I give that to Peter. Peter Virginal, please. Okay, so the um, airspex was tested against the standard microbial, so the standard bacteria and the standard yeast and more recently the enveloped viruses. And basically these microorganisms are selected in the test methodologies in order to be representative of the, the microorganism under test. So bacteria, for example, there are four test organisms defined in the methodology, and for yeast, there's one um, species that's referenced. And these will give efficacy against all bacteria that are falling in that category, or the microorganism that is falling in that category. Um, the same with viruses, we have tested in suspension uh, efficacy against enveloped viruses of which SARS-CoV-2 belongs, and we have demonstrated that in the suspension test it is efficacious. If we're looking at organisms like mycobacteria, um, these would involve other tests which, like, um, which airspex hasn't been carried out on. But the general um, food hygiene species like your Listeria, your Campylobacter, will all be covered by the general um, bacterial testing that's been carried out, and the same with the yeast and the fungi. Hope that answers your question. All right, Peter, thank you for that. Then another one for Thomas Dubowski. 
Um, does the usage of air specs need to be labeled or declared on the finished good packaging? No, of course not, uh, because that is not a food, um, let's say, additive, or it's, it's even not uh, intended to 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 be mixed with the food. Um, so Aspex is uh, registered as a biocide, and, and as Peter mentioned, so we have all the data for the efficiency, and uh, we also demonstrate that there is no disinfectant effect on food. So the contents of Aspex um, is not harmful to the food, and, and the concentrations is uh, very, very low, so that there is, um, yeah, nothing to, to detect in the food at the end of, of the chain because uh, yeah, the remainings on the food will be uh, is not detectable. So and then also the, the actives we use um, uh, becomes uh, ha completely harmless ingredients such as water or acetic acid, but with low concentration without any having, having any impact on, on food taste or whatever. Um, so therefore, of course, there is no declaration of, of food needed when, when using air specs. Um, I hope this answers the question. All right. So you referred to the air treatment not suitable for areas with large air exchange. Is this the case for air specs? And if so, what do you define as large air exchange? Means uh, number of air changes per hour. I think that goes also to Thomas in terms of decentralized. Yeah. <laughs> so, me again. So yeah. So we we always look at the individual case. Uh, um, what is the air exchange? Uh, what is the situation with the air? Um, for instance, if you have very large rooms with an, uh, maybe um, big air um, re re refreshment, so exchanging air in a high frequency eight times an hour. Um, an air treatment makes no sense um, on uh, for ecological reasons, of course, costs becomes much too high, and for technical reasons. So that is a, a clear limitation for aspects. If there is a very high air ex exchange and fresh air is added to to the environment, um, for my opinion, and, and that's also in line with, with the authorities in my region. There is a dilution effect, which is significant, uh, suitable to lower the risk of any infection. Um, but I have to mention that in, in some of, of our slaughterhouse here in my region, they have already yeah, taken measures on air control by hiring the supply of fresh air and, yeah, the, day before and, and today I got two messages, there's two outbreaks here in my region. So as mentioned, we think that the combination of different methods is suitable to, to control the uh, microorganisms in air. So that, that should be uh, um, investigated in any individual case. We have calculations available. So uh, we look at the air supply, uh, the, the room size, and then we calculate, um, yeah, make it is it, is it um, sensible to use NAD treatment, um, or is it for what reason ever not possible to add any biocides to the air to, to get an effect? Okay, now I've got one from Michael. Um, how common is airborne listeria based on your experience? Would you recommend air treatment of surface or surface treatment for airborne listeria? Well, Listeria can be airborne and it can swim and it can uh, be both on surfaces and in the air. So what I would recommend would be uh, a good cleaning for the surfaces, maybe uh, combined with a fogging uh, for the surfaces, and then during the daytime uh, the air specs as uh, air disinfectant. All right. So. Um... Is it applicable in the pharmaceutical industry? Is it FDA approved? Um, I give that to Steph. I was actually hoping you would hand that to Anna or Peter, <laughs> Sandra. Um, Don't worry. Yeah, so also Peter, Anna, who wants to answer? Answer, no problem. <laughs> Uh, 
So can you repeat the question, Sandra, sorry? Is aspects applicable in the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, is it FDA approved? I'm not quite sure what FDA means. I don't know if it is something related to pharmaceutical industry. Okay, that's the North American yes, <laughs> Food, Food and Drug, Drug Administration in the exactly. US. And um, yeah, so we do not have that information for the moment. So as far as I know, biocides are not listed as the FDA. There are some actives listed in the FDA approval list, so that should be checked. Um, as far as I know, that parasitic acids, which is a part of, of airspecs, is listed in the FDA list. And uh, from from that point of view, I think also that uh, it could be used also in pharmaceutical industries. All right, we can cover that in the Q&A when we've completely confirmed that. Thank you. So, can aspects be used in the presence of animals? Handing that to Thomas. That's me again. Yeah, uh, so it's the same with, with humans. So we already mentioned that uh, in presence of personal aspects could be used, and that's the same with, with animals. Um, yeah, so there's no risk uh, for living beings, so to say. Um, so that's, that's safe for, for these applications. We did some measurements also with the, the authorities here in our region. And we, we never reach the threshold, so the limitations for the actives. Um, and uh, even uh, with the level of the measurement method, we do not have any indication that there is uh, actives in the air. So that's really safe, and we are far away from critical levels. And I think that is good information. Um, I have one, one remark to the listeria, because uh, we see also that we got a lot of requests on listeria um, from the environment. I, and I know one case is where um, in a cheese factory, in a, in a storage room, there was an outbreak because of the airing system installed in a room. And, and this is a, um, a system which controls the, the humidity in the air. And there was a biofilm formation with Listeria and a, and a yeah, seriously spread of, of Listeria to the product. So that's, that's a, yeah. True that that uh, least say could be spread by airborne microbes to the products, and, and it's a real risk. All right, thank you. Another question. So it's a lot, <laughs> but we've got another 14 minutes. Uh, all fine. So um, here's a question: We use fogging weekly. Could aspects replace this, as fogging is time-consuming, and we need to go to cleaning during weekly production? I'll hand that to Steph. To answer that, I would say air specs shouldn't be used as a method to replace traditional fogging. Um, I mean, I, I still think it's an essential method for surface disinfection as a, a what I would say a belt and braces approach for your hygiene procedures. So if you're carrying out your normal clean fogging should, and you're currently fogging, you should still continue to do this. Um, air specs is, is completely different from fogging, as, as I hope we've explained. So air specs is, is continual air disinfection whilst there are personnel and product in the room. So it will, once fogging is done and the fog has settled on the surfaces, if somebody was to come in to the area afterwards um, with an issue or, or recontaminate surfaces with any bacteria, yeast or mold, then the air specs will be continually effective while production goes on, whereas fogging has done its job, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Would you recommend it for Bacillus cereus in the air and area during manufacturing process and presence of people? Peter, I give that to you. It's microbiology again. Yeah, um, that would be a difficult one to to um, answer because we haven't tested it against um, the product against bacterial spores. And if we refer back to the, the um, slide on tenacity, we see that bacterial spores um, yeah, are, quite, are, are very difficult to kill. Um, they have a high tenacity to antimicrobial agents, um, and more so than any of the organisms tested. So before we could give any, any advice on that, 
we would um, we would definitely have to do some some efficacy testing um, to see, to demonstrate that it is efficacious against the bacterial spores. Um, but again, this would be the initial testing we would do would be a phase two step one suspension test to assess whether the active would be um, actually efficacious in the first place before we go down the route of then potentially testing any, any further organisms within the air. So at the moment, it, we can't give any real answer on the effectiveness of air specs on bacterial spores, full stop. All right, thank you. So here are a couple of questions uh, in order to clarify, again, the fact around um, aspects being effective against uh, viruses and uh, specifically against the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. So I give that to you as well, Peter. Yeah, so as mentioned in the presentation, um, we're not able to make any claims that air spect is efficacious against viruses in the air. And there's a number of reasons for that. One, we haven't done the, the testing, um, the t including it in the TNO test. And the dossier for the active substance has already been submitted and is in freeze period. However, we do have efficacy data to show that the active itself does have a virucidal effect against envelope viruses on surfaces. We also know from research and experience that envelope viruses are easy to inactivate in the same way bacteria are, and they're also small so remain airborne longer, so therefore increasing the likelihood of coming into contact with the air specs aerosol, which, is which as we've mentioned is continually dosed. So although we cannot make any claims as such, we do expect that air specs will have some effect on viruses as was observed with the TNO bacterial test due to the shared efficacy, sorry, to, due to the shared tenacity and the fact that they are small and remain airborne longer and um, that it is a continual dosing process for air specs. All right, perfect. Then, Now there is the question around um, how much of the product, uh, I suppose it's around air specs, is needed per cubic meter in a room, so as an average standard volume. Some practical examples probably. I give it to Michael. Well, uh since we have to protect both the personnel in the room and the foodstuff in the room, uh, airspace is dosed in a very small amount. So the normal dosing in the air is uh, between 0 0.04 and 0 0.1 milliliter per cubic meter per hour. Uh, for filling lines and packaging, we have uh, slightly higher, which is uh, 40 to 70 milliliter per hour because it's in a closed system. Um, and of course, all the microbiological testing has been done in the same uh, area as, as what we are supplying into the air. I hope this answers the question. All right, thank you. And another question is, what exactly is Aspects, and can it be retrospectively fitted to an existing AHU? I'll give it to Steph. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so air specs can be applied in various ways. So yes, to answer the question, you can apply it to an existing air handling system um, using a bespoke type design that, that we would have to you know, spec out and design specifically for your system and your factory. And it can also be applied locally in smaller areas or directly at the, the point of where your problem is within your factory. Um, and the equipment that's used for it is very specific. So, you know, the nozzle doses it in a very small size particle and very accurately. So you can't use, for example, existing fogging equipment um, to dose air specs, and that, that's very critical. The key to it is the actual equipment that doses it. Okay, and stay with you, Steph. Uh, can air specs also be distributed via air conditioning systems of a site? 
Yes, the same, the same answer applies. And I, I guess, you know, it's not just a, a one size fits all with air specs equipment, okay? So it's very much that we can, um, we will design a system that's specifically suited to your air conditioning or air handling system. Thank you. So another one is what is the mechanism of kill or inactivation? Can can you release free nucleic acids from the microorganisms? The concern is methods, for example, PCR used for swabbing environment. I'll hand that over to Michael. Oh, I was hoping again you would give that to Peter. Uh, I think it's more microbiological. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Peter, are you going to take it? I will. Um, yeah. The mechanism is of action is basically a disruption of um, the the key transport mechanisms across the the, the membranes of the microorganisms and um, disrupting the the structure and causing the cells to basically break down. Um, whether that will release uh, sort of DNA, DNA um, onto surfaces that could be picked up by swabbing, that's something I would have to look into. But um, the mechanism of, of action is definitely disruption of um, disruption of sort of transport mechanisms across the cells and the integrity of the microbial cell itself. So, um, but I will I will provide some further information on the release of nucleic acid in the Q and A handout that we will provide. Perfect, thank you. So here's another one. Um, there has been mentioned that Aspex does not present a risk for living beings. Later on, it has been mentioned that the concentration has to be kept low to protect personnel and food. Does this mean that it could exist a health risk if the dosage is not properly done? Give that to Thomas. Yes, so, um, yeah, there's a lot of, of um, chemicals which, which can be toxic related to concentration. Yeah? For instance, uh, if you uh, eat salt and uh, so the average is gram per kilogram body weight, uh, then you will die by eating salt. So there is um, levels um, and, and uh, thresholds given by the authorities, and, and uh, this is uh, reliable information um, to which, which extent a substance um, can be of concern. Of course, if you have very high concentration of actives, of biocides, whatever you would like to, to use, uh, then you will reach a certain level where um, you have an impact on on health or uh, you have an impact um, on a living being. Um, therefore, of course, the concentration has to be set it, um, as, as recommended, and the systems uh, which apply air specs to the environment um, are reliable and uh, guarantee that it's always the right concentration and the whole thing is also guided with this um, air measurements. So there's easy tests uh, available um, to measure the active substances in the air to ensure that uh, the, yeah, the, the um, maximal uh, critical level is, is never be reached. And, and from our experience, so that's not a new technology. We use air specs now for 10 years. We did a lot of measurements in different sites, and we never had a, um, a measurement which is of concern. So it's always very, very low, and uh, yeah, does not give any indication that there is a risk for personal or for living being. But that, that's a toxicological fact. So uh, a lot of substances become critical uh, according to their concentration. That is also mentioned by Paracelsius uh, a long time ago. So, uh, I hope that this answers the question. All right, we've got other ones. 
So when you mentioned efficacy against viruses, you stated it was in suspension. What type of suspension was it? Was the virus in a liquid or in a gaseous matrix? Peter, that's for you. Yeah. So the suspension test is the standard phase two step one um, test, so the EN14476, which has been modified for um, the FMB area, and it is in a liquid phase. So it's the standard, um, standard simple test to determine how efficacious an active is against the target microorganisms. So it wasn't a gaseous phase, it was definitely a liquid suspension. All right, thank you. I've got another one, and I'd like to hand it to Steph. Can you confirm that traditional fogging has no effect on killing yeast and molds in the air? Okay, so as we've mentioned, you know, you know, fogging is a surface disinfection, okay? Yes, you do apply it in a different way. So you apply it into the air and then it settles on the surface. Now, we are not saying that it has no effect whatsoever on a bacteria, yeast and mold in the air. What we're saying is we have no information on this, so we can't guarantee anything and it's not registered as an air disinfectant method on the BPR. Thank you, Steph. And here's a question like, uh, would air specs be also suitable for office areas, like open space offices? I'll give that to Michael. In combination In with Anna, probably. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> In combination with Anna for regulatory. <laughs> Since it is safe for, for personnel uh, to be in the area, in, in principle, I would say it, it could be safe in an office, but if it's uh, regulatory-wise, I'm not sure we have to leave that to Anna. Oh, our, our disinfection is uh, following, falling into PT2. It is not uh, specific to food and beverage or not food and beverage, so it could be used from a regulatory standpoint. So it makes absolutely sense to have some uh, target sites where to apply air specs to the air. So we it identified in, in food and beverage industry that there are some areas where a lot of people come together, where, where a lot of people are working, or uh, that's uh, very much focused on canteens, on, on uh, social rooms, uh, hygiene sluices, um, and that is focus area for maybe a treatment with air specs to avoid the uh, micro spread or higher load of, of airborne microbes in this environment. Um, where we have a dilution effect by applying fresh air, maybe that's not, uh, makes no sense because it's too expensive and the dilution effect uh, is already uh, efficient to, to lower critical levels of microbes. Um, so that should be decided then from side to side in each individual case um, to find what is the best solution. But that is some target area where, where a lot of people are coming together and, and uh, where it's a real risk that, that uh, yeah, there's a spread from, from one person to another. All right. Thank you, dear panelists. So I think we've covered a large part of the question which were coming in, and we are also at the top of the hour. So I hand over to Marion for the closing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. So as Sandra said, we are now at the end of our webinar time. So thank you so much for all your important and relevant questions. Those are saved and as said before, included into our FAQ catalog to be provided along with a recording of this session. In the meantime, we encourage you to reach out to your local Ecolab representative for more information customized to your plant. There is additional material available on ecolab.com. So have a nice remaining day and please stay safe. Thank you and goodbye.